This is the G Suite Tips and Tricks session for our Digital Instruction Network. So this is uh, kind of an overarching topic here. We're covering G Suite, so there's lots of good stuff um, within Google, but we're gonna focus today on basically how to make your lives a little bit um, simpler, a little more efficient in using all those tools within G Suite on a day-to-day -day basis. And so this particular session, it doesn't matter if you are a teacher or a leader or a support staff person, um, hopefully all of the tips that I share with you today, you can embed in your work and whatever that looks like. So um, I'm gonna start with a section on Chrome and then just give you some tips on Drive, Google Calendar, and then a couple extensions at the end. So the first one is Google Chrome tips and tricks. So to start, so some of these might be oldies but goodies, some of these might be new to you, but hopefully you'll take away a couple of um, tips. So specifically with the Chrome settings, um, I would imagine if you're anything like me, you every day have the same I don't know, handful of tabs that you are constantly starting in, right? For me, you'll see that I, have, I always open up my Gmail, my Google Calendar, my Drive. I have a running doc that's just my kind of to-do list and then um, just some other um, stuff that I do for Risa. So what I would recommend doing if you haven't already set this up is um, go into your Chrome and set up whatever tabs that you are like frequently in. So every day, what are maybe four or five, however many tabs that you're like, I'm always in this program or I'm always using this. So it always takes time to open it up. Go ahead and, and open up those tabs and then organize them in the way, in the order that you want them. Once you have that set, then you're gonna go to your um, Chrome settings and you're gonna scroll down to the section that says on startup. So, if you have not already set this up, you won't have this option selected. I have selected open a specific page or set of pages on startup. So what that means is, um, like I said, those tabs that I wanted open before, I have those set up. And so now that I have it set up the way I want, I can um, just say use current pages. And what that will do is anytime I open up Chrome for the first time, it will automatically open my Chrome with those specific tabs. You can do this a couple different ways, but I find it easier to just set up it, the order in the tabs that you want and then click on use current pages and then it will um, do what you need. You can always go in and adjust these, remove add, um, reset the pages. Um, that is kind of your quick tip for Chrome startup. Uh, the next tip is the Chrome incognito window, which for some of you, unfortunately, it might not be a feature that you can use if it's disabled for your domain or your role. But if for some reason you don't know about it and you didn't realize that you had it, um, what Incognito does is basically allows you to open up a new Chrome window that doesn't have, doesn't remember anything of your prior login. So it's kind of like you're not logged into anything. It's not gonna remember your password from previous times um, or anything that you've logged into previously. And you're probably thinking, well, why would I want to do that? So for me, I frequently use my incognito window when I'm preparing to share any documents or presentations out because it's a really good way to test share settings when it comes to like docs and slides and all that good stuff. But also it gives me a better sense of like, how is this going to look from like the end user, right? So I do that also with like my Google sites. I'll go in and, and kind of preview it that way. So, um, all you do is you go up to the top three, I don't know, a lot of people call it the, the snowman or the ice cream scoops, I don't know. Click that and then you um, just click on new incognito window and it will say you've gone incognito. It's got a little like detective looking guy saying, all right, and the um, window is darker. And so now when you log into, you know, whatever sites you're going to, it will be like, you know, new phone, who dis? Like, who, who is this? I don't remember your login. So um, like, for example, today, I wanted to make sure that um, my uh, Google Slides was shared by everybody and I actually realized that it wasn't. So I went in, I just threw in the link 
and it said you need permission to access this and I was like oops I got to go in and and change my share settings in the in the presentation so obviously now as an incognito person I can see it so that is going incognito and there might be some other use case scenarios so feel free to throw them in the chat if you have any um, suggestions or um, ideas on how you might use that all right the next tip um, so Chrome keyboard shortcuts so and this isn't just specifically a Chrome tip, this is kind of like when you're using lots of stuff in, in G Suite. So I listed not the end all be all list of shortcuts, but these are probably, I don't know, a handful are like my frequent flyer tips and tricks. So since we were just talking about an incognito tab, there is a shortcut for that. So if I just um, type in control shift N, it will automatically open up a new incognito tab. So instead of having to go to the snowman, I feel like we could start a debate with what that's called. And Andrew is probably going to be the ringleader. Actually, there is no debate. It, it is the snowman. <laughs> so there would be no need to start a debate See? because the debate's already mm -hmm. been had and sure. ended. I figured if anyone were to have an opinion, it would be Andrew, right? It's actually not an opinion. It's an established <laughs> fact. Sure, sure. Okay. All right. Um, so anyway, if you're in a, a slide deck, for example, or really anything um, in Chrome, and you're maybe you're in a lengthy document, and you're like, I am looking for a keyword. If you just do control F, it's going to say, okay, what keyword are you looking for? And I can start typing in my keyword and now it's going to tell me, okay, yeah, here's your, your keyword. Now, if I was in a longer like Google doc, then it might list like, oh, you've used the word incognito like 50 times and I could click my little arrows to see how many times and it'll, like each time I click it, it'll take me to um, that word. Control Z, that is probably the one I use the most. So let's say I accidentally delete that. Control Z, just brings it back. Just, it undoes whatever you just did. So that one is really great. I find that one is really nice in Gmail because there's not, at least I'm not aware of like an actual undo button or, or clickable button within Gmail. So Control Z, definitely a lifesaver. Uh, Paste using destination formats. This is another one. So let's say I want to paste from like a different document that I'm using and the formatting is all kinds of different. And I don't want to go in and manually have to be like, okay, I got to bold it like this and change the size and the font. So let's say, and I'll just use the little title for the example. So if I copy that and let's say I want it to be in the formatting that follows, you know, this uh, within my slide. So I'll, I'll have a little tab here, or a little um, bullet here. And if I select Control Shift V, notice how it didn't paste it in like um, up here. It's, it reflected the actual format changes, changes which I use my Control Z to undo. If I just did Control V, ooh, now I have to go in and I have to like man manually change the formatting. So definite, that one, that one's probably, and I keep saying that, but I think that one is the one I use the most but there'll probably be another one that I'll tell you differently. <laughs> control shift eight, insert bullet, control Z undo. Insert link, uh, I, I prefer to, when, I am, when I'm inserting links into um, any type of Google doc or slide, I like to highlight the word, like I had to have the word written out before, that's just my process, but, um, and then I click control K, and now it's gonna say, okay, what's the link that you wanna so instead of having to, you know, highlight it and right click and click link or go up here and click link, it's just control K faster. Duplicate a slide. Uh, if I just have to select the slide that I want to duplicate, control D. And there it is, right? So instead of having to mainly go up and then say insert another slide or right click, I mean, God forbid we right click, right? <laughs> But I mean, everybody's preferences are different. Control keyboard um, shortcuts are everybody's, you know, personal preference. And obviously, if you're not, you know, if you're working like on a Mac, it would be um, command. Uh, what else? Open link in new tab. That's another nice one. Uh, instead of opening a link and having it like replace the window or the tab that you were in, then you have to go back to, you know, go back to where you were. Instead, you can just click control and then hit the link and you'll notice that it pops it out into a new tab, right? 
So control, and then click your, on your link. That's a nice time saver. Reopen your last closed tab. So when I first learned this, I was like, oh, so I've been wasting a lot of time trying to, you know, you accidentally close a tab and you're like, oh, shoot, where did that go? Or I closed out all of my tabs, but like four, and now I want them all back. So I just simply um, hold on the keys, control shift T to open up my last tab, right? And then I can keep clicking that. And every time I do that, it will open up like the tab before that I close. So control shift T, control shift T, control shift T. I mean, you can see all of these things popping up left and right, right? Okay. So just keep clicking control shift T until you find the tab that you accidentally closed. And lastly, from Google Drive to preview your document without having to open it. This one I really I actually didn't know this one for very long. So if I go to my drive, and I don't know about you guys, but my drive is real slow sometimes to like open anything. I don't know if it's just me, but yeah, real slow. So if I want, instead of having to like actually open this up um, and you know have to wait for it to download per se, I can just select the file and then click P and it's just going to give me like a little preview of what it looks like. <laughs> Even then it loads a little bit slow, but anyway, it's instead of having to actually double click and open it up and wait for the whole thing to load, it's just a quick way to preview. So just make sure you select it and then nothing else, click P and it will preview it for you. All right, I'm going to jump to my drive tips and tricks. All right, so the first tip I have is the domain shortcuts. So, I mean, everybody has personal preferences of how they navigate all of the things within G Suite because there's just so many ways to find stuff. That's kind of one of the great things about Google is that like you can do one thing probably five different ways most of the time. So um, if you are someone who doesn't like to go to file, open a new doc, for example, or click new and then go to open a new doc, you can just simply go to a new window and just start typing whatever it is. So docs.new and it will give you a blank canvas. You can do the same thing with sheets, slides, forms, and sites. So you just need a quick blank canvas of whatever um, G Suite tool you're using, the name of the tool, dot new, and you're in good shape. All right, let's jump to some URL hacks. So there's lots of different use case scenarios for why you might want to share a Google Doc or slide, for example, different ways, especially when it comes to collaboration, right? Sometimes if you're using, um, you know, you want to have a collaborative document, but you're not quite sure if everybody in the group is familiar with the make a copy process or, you know, accidentally editing something that they shouldn't, um, or you just want to make that step a little bit easier for them. Uh, the first one I'm going to show you is called force a copy. And I, I put all the details, um, directions in the slide deck so you can follow along that way too. But so I'm going to show you an example. So if I wanted to, well, you just use this random Google Doc here. If I go, if I go to the URL of a Google Doc that I want to have my end user um, not have to go file, make a copy, but be basically forced to make a copy, I go up to the URL, the top and I go all the way down to the far right, and you'll notice that it says edit because I am the owner and I can edit this document. So instead of typing the word or having the word edit, I'm actually gonna remove that word edit and I'm going to replace it with copy. And then when I hit enter, this is what using that link will do for the end user. So now I would grab that link and I would send it out you know, in an email or, or put it in my presentation. And so everyone would see this option to make a copy instead of actually seeing the document. Now, um, keep in mind that the sharing permissions are important to consider here. Like you are, already have to have your document be either anyone with the link or public. So if this is a private document, this isn't gonna work. But this would be for, you know, 
you've got this open-ended document that you want everyone to make their own copy, great. Change the word edit to copy and you're in good shape. And then I also mentioned in um, the uh, slide deck that in terms of using this with Google Classroom, um, Google Classroom is almost too smart for its own <laughs> good in that it will, it will not like read that, make a copy or force a copy, it will automatically, it will basically override it. So if you're looking for that feature, there is a tool that allows you, or a feature that allows you to actually make a copy of whatever document you're using um, within Google Classroom, within your assignments. Um, so just keep that in mind as to when you're using this. The same holds true for, um, with replacing the word copy with if you had a document where you wanted uh, maybe you had comments on it and you wanted those comments to be followed with the make a copy feature. You, instead of just writing copy, you type in copy this whole thing equals true. And then that, when you, when you put that instead of edit, that will force them to make a copy, but the comments will come with it. So there might be a need for copying over the comments and you don't want to give them all, you know, access in the world. That would be a way around that. All right, um, let's see here. The next one is preview. So again, I'm replacing the word edit with the word preview. So I'm gonna go up here and I'm gonna go to the end of my URL. And instead of edit, I'm gonna type in preview, click, click enter and now, they will see a preview version of this Google Doc. So let me actually show you this with the slide deck because it's a little bit, well, a little more impressive. So I'm gonna delete everything ex that um, comes after the word edit, including the word edit, and then I'm gonna type in preview. And this allows me to um, see a, a, a preview, so almost like a presentation view of my slide deck. And what's nice with this, view is I can actually still click on the links. So a lot of times, especially when you're, you know, presenting, like maybe you're not in and out of your Google slide deck as much as I have been right now. Maybe you're really just using your slide deck as like the visual. This might be a great way to navigate the slide deck instead of having to like, you know, go into the slide deck, go in and out of like presentation mode, you can just click on the links within the preview. Okay. All right. Um, and just you can click back to go back to the original version of that's not the preview mode. Now I got to get back to where I, I was here, but so that's preview. The next is the template preview, which essentially allows you to um, force folks to, not really force, but it gives them the option to um, make whatever your slide deck is, for example, a template. So they could just like skip right over the make a copy piece and create your slide deck into a template. So the reason that you might want to do that is, I mean, this is like definitely not the biggest deal in the world, but when you make a copy, file make a copy, it always defaults to that copy of and then the title of your um, document or slide deck. And so with the template part, it just automatically like says, now here's a version of this that you own and you don't have to change the naming conventions. It is what it is. So um, for example, let me go back to my little play Google doc here. And I'm going to type in instead of preview, I'm going to type in template slash preview. I hit enter. And now, not only is it in preview mode, but it eventually will give me um, the opportunity to use as a template. And when I do that, it will automatically add it to my drive. So it's saying, okay, cool. So now you've got this Google Doc. You own it. Notice my naming conventions. It's not copy of. It's this is your document. So it just takes us away that one step of having to make a copy. It's kind of a, I don't know, I feel like this would be helpful if you were, you know, creating 
templates, um, you know, for teachers to use like maybe an example of you have like a lesson that you don't want them to borrow, then they can just immediately use that template. Or, you know, even with students, same thing. So that is our template preview. All right. Next, um, okay, so jumping, kind of switching gears here, we're still within Drive, but uh, we're talking about specifically slides here. So you may have noticed in um, maybe in other slide decks that you can actually link to individual slides within your Google slide deck. So, you know, you can always link to outside sources or link to like a, a different document, for example, but you can actually link within the actual slides. So why might you do this? Well, perhaps you're using like a table of contents at the beginning. You could build that out or this example shows like a, a choice board where you can insert different options of activities and each activity is on a different slide within the same presentation. So all you do is highlight, for example, the, the word you want linked. So we'll just say build. And I can either use my shortcut control K or just right click. And instead of pasting an external link or like a link that I already have for my Google Doc, for example, I, where it says slides in this presentation, I can click the little drop down arrow and then I can select which slide I want it to be linked out to. So let's say I want to use the first slide. Sure, great. Click apply. And so now when I go to that slide, or when I click on that link, it's going to take me directly to the first slide, right? So that's how you would build that out, um, linking within your, you know, all the same slide deck. All right, I'm gonna unlink that just for fun. Next, we're going to jump into Drive and the priority and workspaces. So this, you, you've probably noticed like the big change when, you know, priority came out because that was like, oh, there's like something before my drive. And priority is basically your frequent flyers like, hey, you were in this yesterday or, you know, it just like knows what you've been in more recently. You can click the little, you know, um, arrows to move across and just click open and, you know, instead of having to dig into your drive. So that's great. I enjoy priority. But what I really appreciate is workspaces. So if you haven't used workspaces yet, I highly recommend you play around with it. So workspaces essentially allows you to create kind of like a, kind of like a table of contents or like some bookmarks or shortcuts to anything in your drive. And what you can do is make these shortcuts or these bookmarks and in these workspaces that are organized by topic. So for example, in my work, I frequently have a million agendas to go through. I've got agendas for, you know, every meeting I attend, for example. And so instead of having to go into that specific folder or share drive and have to like dig and dig and dig and dig, instead I've created a workspace that is where all of those agendas from different folders that are shared completely differently and you know different people have access to them I've put them into this workspace and so it if I remove it from this workspace it doesn't mean it's deleting it like out of my drive it's just taking it away from the workspace so it's not really moving it out of the folders it's kind of just like a hey here's a little shortcut to that agenda that you can never find and you're putting them all together in one little workspace so let me show you how that works so um, and you can organize these in, in lots of different ways. I, I did one for agendas. I did one for our 517 EdTech. There's going to be lots of different use case scenarios for this. But um, So I'm going to click the button Create. It's going to say, OK, what do you want to call this workspace? I'm going to call this my DIN sample. Click Create. And then it's going to open up my workspace. And it's going to say, okay, cool. So you've got this workspace. What do you want to add to it? It's going to give me some suggestions or I can say, let's choose some other files. Then I can go in just like normal, you know, select recent, my drive, shared drives, and I can really go through anything that's in my drive to add to that workspace. So sure, I'll add 
this guy, and I'll click done. Or I can add more files, so I'm going to say done for now. So now if I scroll down, and oh, and it does it by alphabetic order, and you can't change that if that annoys anybody, sorry. <laughs> the DIN sample is now here, and I can click here to view the workspace, or if I want to edit it, I can click the little snowman. I can rename it, I can hide the workspace, or I can remove the workspace. And I can always go in and view it and then like remove things that are in that workspace. I can also add more files, right? Or I can just get rid of it altogether. Allison, we have a couple of questions about workspaces. Do you know if you can make folders within your workspace? I or believe it's only actual documents that you can have in your workspace. There are some limitations with workspace um, in that you can only have eight. I don't know why, but that's that's all it has room for. So, and you and I think I've tried to do this before. Where I've tried to add a an actual folder, and there's a reason why I think it says add files is that it doesn't play that game. How about sharing a workspace? Could you share? one of those workspaces with a colleague? That is a really good question. I have, oops. And look at that, control shift T, we're back in business, phew. Um, sorry, I'm trying to exit out of my um, workspace and exit out of the, all right, so back to my drive. Someday I'll find it, here we go. I don't believe you can share workspaces with um, colleagues, but I will have to look into that one. Does anyone off the top of their head know? Do you see how slow my <laughs> everything runs? Okay. Any other questions about workspaces while this is taking forever to load? Let me check the chat real quick while we're waiting here. I just couldn't find the option. Like yours said, add a new workspace. Mine doesn't have that. So where would I initially start if I don't have a workspace? It doesn't. Okay. Um, so if you are, do you see priority? Yep. Okay. And then under priority, you don't see workspaces at all, or you don't see the create button. Hold on. Now I see it. I don't use okay. priority because that <laughs> it bothers me to have those thumbnails at the top so my yeah. automatically opening just to my drive now I see it under I gotcha priority. okay yeah so, so the priority yeah the priority shortcuts are a little different than the my drive shortcuts but yeah that's that's how I um, discovered it and keep in mind that um, yeah there's only there's only a uh, room for eight but it looks like I just wanted to test that um, theory about sharing but I don't believe that you can yeah I don't I don't believe that you can share workspaces with colleagues, but that would be pretty slick. But the idea is essentially that you're, you know, kind of organizing it for your own quick use and access. Um, but who knows? Google's pretty good about adding things. So, all right. Jumping back into my slide now that I closed out everything. Um, we are moving to advanced commenting. So I'm going to jump to, boy, oh boy. It's really thinking. I'm going to jump to my random Google Doc. So just a quick tip. During a presentation, try not to close out like your entire Chrome because, you know, sometimes sometimes for a sense of problem. <laughs> uh, all right. So commenting, advanced commenting and assigning tasks. So what this um, uh, feature does is I'm guessing most people are familiar with the ability to comment on a document. Google Doc. So I can highlight, you know, Word and I can, you know, either use this shortcut or go up here. I can add a comment and, you know, type it in like normal, leave a comment, or um, to assign that task or basically conclude, notify someone of a comment that I'm making. I could say, like, for example, at Andrew and start typing his name and then. I can leave a message like, please complete. And now I can click assign to Andrew. And when it when I click assign, it's going to basically say, okay, so Andrew's gonna be notified of this 
Oh, and it's also saying that this document isn't shared with him, but so I'm going to give him commenting permissions. Say, so okay, got it. And so now when Andrew um, gets emailed this notification, like, hey, Allison has said, you know, you know, take a look at this. Once he's completed that, he can actually click completed or I think it's resolve. And then I will get a notification that he has completed the um, assigned task. So it's really nice for when you're in like a collaborative Google Doc when you don't want to have to always go in and be like, okay, did they update it or, you know, or, or have they done that part so now I can do this part. It's just a nice way to seamlessly communicate without having to like constantly, you know, check in on that specific collaborative and that, document. And that can be really useful too because like if you've got multiple pieces you're working on, maybe you're at your school and you're on this committee and you're on that committee, you've got your department meeting or whatever, and your brain is just not on that thing, but, but someone else's brain is on that thing and they know they need a to-do list item for you. They, you get an email from that so that you can say, like, when you get a chance, check out this document because there's a piece we want you to do. Definitely. All right. Um, so the next, okay, so that was assigning tasks. Um, the next uh, feature is version history, which I oftentimes um, find folks that maybe are a little less comfortable with using Google Docs and such um, are unaware of this feature and that like if something were to happen in a collaborative doc where, you know, somebody accidentally deletes your portion or I know you, you go to a doc one day and it looks the way you expect it and then the next day something has happened. I, in fact, I've even done that to myself where I have been like working on a slide deck and then I like delete out a whole section and the next day I'm like, what, why, why did I do that? Um, so it's not just pointing fingers at others. It's like, hey, I need to go in and check my own stuff. But you just simply go to file version history and then say see version history. It's going to pop up basically like a a play-by-play -play of what was updated when and you can really get into the nitty-gritty so like if I were to like, expand this it would show um, like specific time frames and like I could go back and select versions so like I could just view a version and then I'm not saying like okay I want it to be like this now I can just go back and see oh, okay this is how I had it and I actually do this a lot, like if I accidentally deleted one slide, but everything else is done, I would go in and then like just copy that slide and then click back, not restore, but back. So then I'm out of the um, restored version, I'm out of the version history, and I still have grabbed this, the one slide that I needed. So this, if this was a collaborative document, then you would see, instead of my name every time, you would see a different person's name um, and so you could go back and see like what they've added. So this is, could actually be a great saver for, you know, if somebody actually deleted something or like, hey, who had this or oops, I accidentally, you know, goofed up my own section. Um, but you could also use this as a teacher perspective of like looking at like the um, writing process or like the project development process on a collaborative piece. Um, you could potentially even check for plagiarism. There's lots of different use case scenarios in this particular tool. So that's version history. Then we have um, translate Google Docs and I'm going to go to my random Google Doc here and I'm going to say under tools translate document and it's going to say okay I'm going to create a version of this that's going to be in a different language so I can choose my language and since I Sure, German, took that in high school. Translate. And now it's creating a version. Notice that it popped it out into a different window, a different Google Doc that's like the translated version of my Google Doc. So instant translation. This would be great. And, you know, foreign language classes, but also for ESL students, lots of good stuff for that one. All built in with the Google. Next is advanced sharing. So recently, I don't know, probably a couple months ago, Google changed the look and feel of their sharing. And with that came the location of those advanced sharing settings. So if I click sharing, and then I can see, you know, who shared this document. But if I go up to my little gear icon, 
um, this is where I can um, enable and disable different features here. So if I want to turn that on or off, um, I'm not sure why it only has one of those features available, but basically what I'm showing you here is, let me jump out of that. Um, editors, so when you normally when you say share with people settings, you can, you've got two options. Editors can change permissions and share, and then viewers and commenters can see the options to download printing copy. So these are two kind of like hidden little gem share features that you can basically like lock things down a little bit more if you want. So for purposes of this first one, you might want to enable this one. Editors can change permissions and share, or you might want to disable that one for certain reasons. So for example, maybe you're, you're on a document that's got very sensitive information and you only have like certain people share to this document and you want to really lock it down so that even the editors can't like share it with somebody else or give permissions for someone else to edit it, right? So that it still allows them to edit it. It just locks down their sharing abilities a little bit more. The second one is the viewers and commenters can see the option to download, print, and copy. And that um, totally depends on what your purpose is, but there might be a time where you don't want your audience to be able to make a copy of your slide deck, for example, and make it their own, right? So there might be a time in which you want to um, make your information or whatever you're working on a little bit more, um, not necessarily private, but not be able to be reused in a, in a certain way. So those advanced sharing features are still the same. They just are now in that gear icon. And I just wanted to mention that those features exist because, you know, they're, they're pretty hidden. The drive advanced search bar. Let's jump there into our drive, my drive. And so up at the top, lots of people have different preferences about how they find things in Drive. I don't think there's even like a recommendation because I, I think there's so much about personal preference. Um, some folks have, you know, workspaces and folders set up differently. Even their, their view could be different. Um, but with it, when it comes to searching in Drive, you know, you can always just, you know, start typing in, in a keyword, for example. But what you could also do is click this little carrot and it expands it a little bit further. So you can even um, search by like, okay, I have no idea what it's called, but I know it was a Google Doc, or I know that I am the owner. Um, and so you can like really dig in, you know, I know what folder it's in, or it was modified within this range, or has a keyword. So you can really dig in further and further. Um, now, obviously, the more filters you set, the smaller solutions you're going to yield, or the smaller options you're going to yield. But that's great because if you just kind of open-endedly type in a keyword, sometimes, you know, like ed tech, that's going to yield a lot of results. So this is a way to kind of narrow those search features to find what you are looking for a little bit easier. And the last little tip within Google Drive is, I mean, I think everybody knows you can add images and links and videos and all kinds of fun stuff. But what I really enjoy is the ability to insert those things, but also search for those things within the same entity. So what I mean by that is if I click insert and I'm searching, let's say if I want to insert an image, but I don't quite know what it is yet. I know what I'm looking for, but I don't have it like saved in my drive or my photos. So what I can do is just click on search the web and instead of having to go outside of slides to go to, you know, Google images and search that way. Now I can search my keyword and Google lets me just simply select right there, insert, boom, done. And what's um, nice is that I don't have to worry about like making a copy or inserting it or like, you know, file saving or anything. It's just boom, it's right, right there. And the same thing goes for when I insert like a, uh, a video clip. If I'm like, I, I know there's a video on YouTube that I, I just can't remember, you know, just literally you can just type in your keywords and search and then it's going to you know, yield results, and then you can, again, select whatever you want and insert that video. So you don't have to leave. It's all built in right here within your slide deck. So jumping to Google Calendar. All right, so 
depending upon uh, what you use, this next part, you, you might not be using Google Calendar. I know lots of folks have like Gmail, but they're still using Outlook or, you know, whatever that might be. But in the event that you use Google Calendar for school or even for personal, I think you might find some benefit in, in these, these uh, tips. So, for example, let me jump to my calendar here. And I just want to acknowledge the importance sometimes of adding specific features within um, your calendar. So there's, there's really so much you can embed into an event, right? So I can give it a name, I can um, add a time frame, I can add guests, I can embed, you know, Google Meet or Zoom, I can add a location, and when I send that invitation, it is a link that when people click on it, it then gives them the actual, like, Google Maps link, right? Um, I can also go up to or go to more options and then it expands it out further and this is where it, where it really gets fun again I can add my my um, guests here but if I scroll down I can add um, additional things down here like and I don't know why my icons look like this it, it's bizarre but it, it works if I hover over I can add an attachment so I can change you know all the different font things and all that um, I can also insert links like external links and remove formatting. So I highly encourage that when you add stuff to your calendar, that it's not just the date and time, but it is the location, it is who's included, it's maybe a description or some brainstorm or some ideas or add the agenda, add the agenda or whatever key documentation because that really for your end user or for the participants of your event, they don't have to go digging through their drive to find whatever it is that we're talking about and it's all right there. In addition to that, I highly encourage you to, when under guest permissions, I think sometimes we just stick to the default that guests can invite others or see the guest list, but unless you're, you know, working in a particular situation where you wouldn't want anybody to modify the event, if you're in like a work group, you might want to enable this modify event so then other folks can add to your brainstorm list or attachments or that sort of thing. So I am really a, a supporter of adding as much detail as you can to a Google Calendar event. So then, like when you're in a rush and it's like two minutes before the Zoom meeting, you just click on that and you've got all of your stuff right living in that calendar. It's just a nice little time saver. Next, I'm going to jump to find a time. So this is a nice little hidden gem as well. So let's say in my um, little test event, let's say I am inviting, I'll just invite my myself, like my personal account. So I've added myself to my own event, um, but under, instead of event details, now I'm going to say find a time. So what this does is it takes my work calendar and my, like whoever's invited calendar. So right now there's just one person, so I, I could select on like a specific guest or multiple guests if I wanted to pick somebody else, but, um, and I can go like find a different date that would work or a different time. And so the kicker is obviously is that I have to have this calendar, like that person's calendar has to be shared with me. Um, and it doesn't have to be like all the events. Like I don't have to know that this is where they're going to be, but I just have to be shared like visibility. So it might just say busy between 11 and 12, for example. Um, and so this is just like a quicker way of being like, oh, I, I already see that from 11, 12, it's not going to work for this person. So I'm going to pick a different time. So find a time is a really nice little time saver for making events, but with people who have access um, to your calendar and you have access to theirs. In addition, the more options within Gmail event RSVP. So if I were to receive an invite to an event, let me go into presentation mode here, and um, I wanted to, instead of just say like, no, I can't go or maybe, because then that requires to normally like another follow-up email and all that, I can select more options and I can actually propose a new time. Okay, so, so here's my event that I invited myself to. And under more options, I select propose a new time and then it pops open my calendar and it says, okay, so that time didn't work for you, like what does? 
So now I can look at um, my calendar and the event coordinator's calendar and say, okay, like what would be a good time here? And so I can say, you know, actually I want um, a different time. I'll say one, sure, even though that totally doesn't work. Say, so, sure, wait, let's do one o'clock. So then from one to two, and I can even add a, how about this? Add a little note, send proposal, and then this person will receive that notification in their email saying, hey, so-and-so has suggested that you change the time to this. And so, and then you can accept it or decline it. And then it just eliminate, eliminates that like back and forth, like, yeah, that didn't work or maybe, okay, well, why maybe? You know, it just, it gives you a little bit more um, streamlined communication with just a one click, like, let's try this time. Create an event from an email. So let's say you are having an exchange of emails with your team or you are planning on creating an event, but you've got a lot of keywords in an email and you've got the same group of people in that email that's going to be on the event. You can actually minimize the time by going to that event or that going to that email, for example, and this is a really random email that I found a long time ago between Andrew, Christy and I, but so um, instead I can go into the email and say, um, create event. It's going to open my calendar and it's going to say, okay, cool. Now I'm going to create an event based on that email. And what it does is, is it puts the subject line in the event title. It um, automatically puts in the people that were on the email into my guest list. And then this is the part that you might have to clean up a little bit, but this is where it puts like the body of the email into your description. So there might be a, a, a time for that where like, yeah, there's only a key, few keywords or so there's some great discussion that I, I just want to leave it in there and boom, I can change the date and the time, change the subject and I've got myself an event. So sharing Google Calendar with others and yourself. So you can go to your Google Calendar and share your calendar with others. I think that's a pretty common thing to do. But um, one, recommend one recommendation I have is when you go and share with specific people like here, and you add the names and you give the permissions. Um, what I like to do is with my work calendar and my personal calendar, I like to give them both access. So I use Google Calendar for both work and personal. So what I do is I um, basically give like all of the freedom to like manage and like change events and all that stuff to both. So if I'm in my work calendar and I'm like trying to schedule a meeting, I'm like, oh shoot, do I have a dentist appointment that day? Yeah, I do. I can turn it on, turn it off, but I can also be like, oh, I've got to add an appointment to my personal calendar, even if I'm, if I'm in my work calendar. Like I can seamlessly make changes no matter what calendar I'm in. And so it kind of just saves you time instead of having to like, you know, like unlog out or log out out of that account and log into a different or even go incognito. It just gives you that access back and forth to personal and work accounts. Um, let's see, a couple more with calendar, if we run out of time here. Um, the duplicate copy to, um, within, a, within an event, you always have this more actions button. And if you click more act actions, you can duplicate an event or you can copy it to a different calendar. So this is nice when you're like, okay, this is an event that is relevant or it's been, you know, I've been invited to this event or this is a, an event that needs to be on my work calendar. But you know what, I also need it to be on this other shared calendar so everybody else can see just a quick little shortcut to that. I've got just a couple more. Yeah, we'll just we'll just finish up calendar and uh, maybe extensions will be for another time. Um, advanced search in calendar, just like it was within um, Drive. Just don't forget that you have the ability to search up at the top here for keywords, and you can click that drop down and dig into further. So I've done this for past events when, for some reason, I needed those details. I've searched you know, by keyword or by, you know, participants, that sort of thing. And it functions very similarly to the one in Drive. And I believe the last tip that I wanted to share before we wrap up today is very simple. When I'm in my Google Calendar and I just, I just want to be able to, you know, jump to a, any date, like maybe two years from now. And I don't want to have to go click, 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 and wait and wait and wait for it to finally get to 
you know, September 2022. Instead, I'm just, I'm in my calendar and I literally just click G. Hold on, I have to actually be in the calendar. Okay, G. Go to date. Cool. Let's go to September 23rd, 2022. Okay, go. And there we are. And when I want to get back to today, I click today. Yep, so literally just click the word or the keyword, um, key G, and it takes you to any date.